Hello everybody, my name is Rob Nally. I'm a field agronomist based out of Kentucky. Behind me is a pretty good looking cornfield. It was planted towards the beginning of April and a great example for what I want to talk about today. I want to cover some of the beginning reproductive stages in corn. And I'm going to work through some disease concerns I have of some developing threats in our area. So we start the reproductive stages at what we call VTR1. So VT is when the tassels fully emerged. R1 is the silk, so when we have the first few silks starting to come out of the husk on those ears, uh, we've moved into the R1 growth stage. We can see the silks here in the end have wrapped up, but when they first come out, they're yellow. Uh, and they're hoping that we have some synchrony between the tassels as they shed pollen grains down to the silks. Every one of these silks was connected back to a kernel. So uh, hopefully those, those pollen grains have found each of those individual silks and have come back and made their way to the ear. Now, each of these plants on an ear can hold about a thousand kernels. We end up only harvesting about 600, but uh, we certainly want to have uh, good conditions and healthy plants during uh, the VT R1 stage. Any stress we get in that time can limit that. We can have less kernels to fill later in the season. Now, starting also at the R1, the beginning of the reproductive stage, we're taking up about a quarter inch of water, just over a quarter inch of water every day. That continues through the R3 or milk stage in corn. So we're rapidly uptaking water at pollination. We're still taking up nitrogen and some other macronutrients. As we move to later stages, these plants will take from the leaves and some other places and start to fill the ears. So we'll move from, we'll move from the, the tassel of the silk stage and we'll move to R2, which is blister. So blister, some kernel development has begun. If you were to break it in half or pull a kernel off and pop that open, there would be a clear liquid inside. We're just beginning uh, to, to fill some starch content uh, it's still an important stage uh, for development in those plants. But the ear in front of me today has reached the R3 growth stage. So we have further developed, there's more starch content in this, and we bust this, this kernel open, uh, it'll have a milky consistency. So blister is clear, we break this kernel open, it's got a milky consistency. So starch content is getting higher, we're filling up grain. At any point between VT and R3, we can abort kernels. Uh, you know, we can, what, kernel weight can change at any point, really from, from VT through R5, we can reduce the weight of those grains, but reducing a kernel number can be a significant yield impact. So at R3, that's 22 days from when those silks first emerge, those are critical stages. So that first month of production uh, after silking the R3 are some of the most important in a corn's life. Knowing our crop's growth stage is especially important for our next topic, and that's fungicide applications. When we dive into the PFR book, we'll find that the most profitable timing for a fungicide is that VTR1 timing when the silks are emerging uh, and the tassels are coming out. We'll be also be surprised to find, instead of early, the later applications, or at least for, for crops that were planted later, are our most profitable applications of fungicide in a the year. There's enough other plants growing earlier in the year. There's enough of the pathogen out there to, to inoculate the other fields. And so for that case uh, and the vulnerability of that VT stage, we'll see profitability in spraying a fungicide at VT for later planted crops, which were a lot of this year with how wet our spring was. So VT is the best time, but there are some cases where R3, like behind us today, is still a profitable timing to spray a fungicide. For our area in Kentucky and southwest Indiana, we have a pathogen called Southern Rust show up. It can be profitable to spray at that R3 time frame, and that's exactly what's happened. If you look at the picture on your screen, you'll see that in Davis County and in Critton County, Kentucky, as of July the 11th, tested positive for having southern rust. And I suspect that might to continue as we continue further into this month and the beginning of August. There will be more counties that have this pathogen. There's rain in the forecast and there's heat to move it around. The reason why southern rust is such an economic pass for our area is how prolific it can be. It doesn't take very long between it landing on a leaf and spreading more pustules on there. It takes about seven days and it can spread very, very quickly and can be extremely yield robbing. It's blocking photosynthetic tissue and it's leaving those pustules and they're taking up more and more nutrients, which are gonna rob from our grain yield. Now, the, the economics on that are again, you know, the best timing is VT to that R1 and then all the way to R3 like today. But walking this field, I just don't see uh, much of any disease, especially not Southern rust. I couldn't find any rust here. That doesn't mean it doesn't show up. So we need to be walking fields and looking for this pathogen. And we shouldn't just look anywhere. For me, when I'm walking through a field, especially looking for rust, I'm looking at the middle of the plant here. I'm looking at the ear leaf, the leaf below it, and the leaf above it. 
I want to see what's there. Those are the most important leaves, at least when we're determining the economics of a fungicide. So we want to look in the middle there and we want an R-Grow stage. So if we move past R3, if we're to the dose stage, it may not be profitable to spray for this pathogen. So suppose we do need a fungicide application. We're at R2. We, we've got rust starting to show up. We've got some other pathogens. We want to spray a fungicide. What should we spray? The PFR book is a great tool to use. There's a number of PFR proven, multiple mode of action fungicides we could spray. Another resource for you is from the Crop Protection Network. They've rated, uh, it's from the university system, they've rated a the number of fungicides against all kinds of pests, and southern rust is one of those. So we'll want to spray a fungicide that's rated as very good to excellent against southern rust. Southern rust can be a scary pathogen, but certainly one we can control with a timely fungicide application. If you have any questions about corn pathogens or anything about corn or soybeans in general, feel free to reach out to myself or your local BEX representative. Until then, stay safe out there.